Good morning, Professor Sanelli, dear students. We are really happy to receive you at São Paulo State University, even if using the technology to be better if you could stay with us in Franca. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm really happy to meet you again after our uh, first opportunity to dialogue. I think that it was in the end of uh, in 2018 in Rio, during a, a conference organized in the uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And we exchanged some emails in that time. And uh, I preserve your contact because uh, I think that sometime you could uh, be in touch again. Uh, so we prepare a subject in our uh, law course in the School of uh, Human and Social Sciences. Uh, um, and we are discussing here in a special subject about uh, human rights, the challenges for social state in, in Brazil facing the pandemic and also uh, Bolsonaro's uh, uh, presidency. And we invite different uh, experts uh, from different areas like health, education, uh, public administration, economy, to uh, share ideas with us. We have here students uh, from, uh, from the, the last year of uh, the last period of the uh, law graduate course and also from our postgraduate program and, uh, in, in master and PhD. And we think that it will would be really interesting to make some comparative reflections with countries that uh, share some challenges and uh, historical uh, similarities with Brazil, uh, for example, the post-colonial condition and the great uh, inequality. So yesterday we received professors Eva and uh, Pillai discussing the cases of India and South Africa and comment a little about the uh, UK, it's a different uh, reality. And now we, we have the honor to receive you, Professor Sanelli Sibanda from Pretoria University, South Africa, and uh, who uh, have also already shared with you a, a very, very interesting piece for uh, those one that studies constitutional law, political science, and uh, many thanks, Professor Sanelli. You have uh, the word, please, to present your ideas and after to discuss then with our students from NESP. Okay, uh, Professor Murillo, thank you. Thank you so much, firstly, for, for, for the invitation. It was really lovely to, to hear from you after, after, after a few years. You, you know, as an academic, we, we, travel, we travel a lot, we meet people. And, um, and sometimes that's the only time you ever get to, to meet people. So uh, I'm, really, I'm really, really honored uh, that you, you reached out and you made me part of your, part of your, your, your classes. Um, but just one, one, quick, one quick question. How much time, how much time do we have? Um, we have one hour and a half. One hour and a half, okay. So I'll, just, I'll try and make sure then that I leave I leave enough time for for, discuss, for discussion, and then um, if 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 I'm going too fast, um, please just pop a note in the in the chat. Just to ask ask me to slow to slow down. So um, I think as as Professor Morello has, has has already pointed out, I am more a con a, a scholar of constitutionalism than I am. A uh, human rights, a human rights scholar, but obviously that doesn't mean that our worlds are not are not the same, because even with respect to human rights, or especially with respect to human rights, I think it's important that we take time to think about the world in which. Um, we practice human rights, the world in which we imagine human rights, and in particular, from a constitutional, from a constitutional point of view or from the point of view of constitutionalism, 
when we think about human rights, we also need to think about power relationships, political power relationships. We have to think about economic power relationships. And then particularly in a post-colonial state, we also have to be conscious of cultural, of cultural questions, because cultural questions also impact on, on, on knowledge and how knowledge travels and, and, and basically issues of issues of epistemology are important. So those are just a few opening remarks. I'm going to share my slide and then and then and then start in earnest. Let me try and do that. Where is no okay I'm gonna let me try that again. Okay, can you see, can you see my slide, my, my presentation? Yes, yes, it's fine. Okay, fantastic. Okay. But it's uh, not just yet in the full screen mode. Sorry? It's not yet in the full screen mode. There you go, and now? Not. S still not in full screen mode? No. Okay, let me try. Let me try again. But but it's fine to to see. No no problem. Is it okay? I'm just gonna try one more time. Sorry, just yeah. Uh, no, I prefer if. We will get there. Okay, right. Obviously, that's the. So, what I'm going to speak to is—is—is is, is, is that fine? Yeah. Yes. I'm, yeah, I'm going to discuss the paper that um, that I circul that was circulated. Uh, when do you call time on a compromise? South Africa's discourse of transformation and the future of transformative constitutionalism. And my presentation really is going to be one that unfolds like this i'm going to just give a little bit of a little bit of background particularly because i'm speaking to an audience that is not south african and just to also give you a sense of where i'm where i'm coming from with uh with my paper then i'm going to talk about this idea um that i like to talk about of miracle constitutionalism I'm sure many of you, um, even prior to starting this course, will have heard people talk about the South African constitution uh, and, and, and South Africa's constitutional transition. If not that, I think everybody will have heard of Nelson Mandela. And if you've heard about Nelson Mandela, the reason you've heard about Nelson Mandela is because people think he, people position him as one of the greatest leaders to have walked the earth because he managed to take South Africa from uh, an, 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 a racist apartheid state and you know, working with other people, establish a constitutional uh, democracy. And many people then say that it was, a, it was a miracle. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And also that's just for background and context. Then I'm going to discuss what I call the case for transformation. Whilst in my presentation, I problematize or I want us to think critically about this idea of transformation, I also want to recognize that the reason in South Africa we speak so much about transformation is because there is a transformation that is needed. There's a transformation that is needed and, I, and it's important to share some thoughts about why there is a case for for transformation. And then after that, I will discuss what I call the pitfalls of a discourse of transformation. And what I will be meaning there is that whilst there is a need for transformation in South Africa or for South Africa to be transformed, the fact that everybody 
talks in terms of transformation without it being clear what transformation means also comes with problems. And I'll be discussing some of those problems. And then I will talk about uh, transformative constitutionalism. Transformative constitutionalism is an idea that um, initially gets conceived or conceptualized in South Africa. South Africa, is, as, to my knowledge, was the first place where we talked about transformative constitutionalism. But now the idea of transformative constitutionalism has traveled quite widely. You will hear people in Kenya talking about it. You will hear people in Eastern Europe speaking about, about it. You'll hear people in India and you'll hear people in Latin America talking about transformative constitutionalism. And I will talk a little bit about transformative constitutionalism because it has become the central idea or the central conception or conceptualization of constitutionalism in South Africa. Um, I have argued that it has become a hegemonic idea in that most people buy into it and accept it as the going idea of how we frame and understand constitutionalism. Then, um, taking us to where I want us to go, I'll then take some time to reflect on the nature of constitutionalism, because my main argument is that transformative constitutionalism as an idea is an idea that has become misleading and has resulted in a mischaracterization of what constitutionalism is about. Transformative constitutionalism in the way that it operates in South Africa has functioned in a way that it now stops us thinking about other uh, political, cultural, and economic questions that go into how our society is, is constituted. So I am critical of the way that the idea of transformative constitutionalism has emerged and operates. And this is, this is really where our presentation will take us. And then I will end off by talking about what I believe should be the future of transformative constitutionalism or how we should approach the idea of transformative constitutionalism um, in the future. Okay, so a little bit of a little bit of background. Um, the way that South Africa emerges from colonial apartheid or in the end days apartheid can be said to happen as a result of a stalemate. The apartheid government, the white apartheid government, had been oppressing and fighting with the black population for a very, very long time, for over a century. But as the 1980s came about, the violence, the, the violence, the racism, the inequality, and so forth, did not seem to have an obvious way in which they were going to end. In many other African countries, the end, of the end of colonialism arrived through war or a, an external colonial power pulling out and handing over and handing over power to, a, to an African elite, normally in the form of a political party. But those of you that are familiar with the history of, 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 of South Africa will know that South Africa as yeah, a settler. Excuse me, Professor Nell, excuse me. Uh, yeah. uh, some students are uh, saying that it's, it's true. Your presentation is still in the first slide. I don't know if you, you intend to, uh, to present another one. Uh, I have changed. I'm on slide number three, so I don't know how. So now, now, yes. Now it's fine. So shall I maybe let me go in this, in this format rather than the full screen format? OK. Uh, okay, let's see. Is it is it moving? No. It's uh, now in slide three. Now at four. 
Okay. Five. I don't know why. Okay. Okay. I'll stay in this mode then. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so let's 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 slide three. And I've just noticed the other slides don't have numbers for some strange reason. But anyway. So so the history then is that South Africa as a settler as a settler colony ended up with a very big permanent white white population. And as such, um, unlike other African colonies, there was no withdrawal of the colonizing of the colonizing state. Instead, you had a situation then where you had a stalemate where the internal white population and the and the and the black population continued to be enemies and at war, but neither had the power to finish off to finish off or to drive out the other. So there was a so there was a stalemate. And this is really what ends up leading to the, the constitutional negotiations that bring us to South Africa's current constitution, which is which is widely celebrated. But it's also important in un understanding this background that there was the influence of the end of the Cold War between the, the East and the West. The West historically had supported the apartheid, the apartheid government, particularly the United States and the United uh, and, and, and Britain refused refused to take action against the apartheid government, whereas the liberation movements, uh, the ANC was supported by by uh, Russia or the United Soviet Socialist Republic, and other movements were supported by by China and so forth, such that when the Berlin Wall fell and the Cold War came to an end, there was pressure on both sides, the apartheid government and the liberation movements to, to end, to, 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 to bring an end to apartheid. And this led to the unbanning of the nationalist liberation movements uh, and then forced both parties to find a way to speak to each other. They were enemies before, but now as enemies who, ca who cannot defeat each other, what must they do? And that's where then the road to, the road to negotiations was established. And so with negotiations, with negotiations happening, um, the two sides, the, 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 the apartheid government and the black liberation movements couldn't agree on a way to bring the to 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 bring about uh, the end of apartheid and the coming into being of a free of a free South Africa and in the end what was then agreed was that they would compromise and that compromise would entail entering into an interim constitution which came into being in 1994 and that interim constitution allowed South Africa to hold national elections. Those national elections saw the ANC voted into power and the establishment of a, of a, of a parliament, of a democratically elected parliament. And that democratically elected parliament then was given the responsibility of drafting a constitution, the final constitution and in drafting that final constitution that constitu the, 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 the constitutional assembly was guided by 34 constitutional principles now why do i mention these 34 constitutional principles i mentioned these 34 constitutional principles because they are important in that they represented the negotiated or compromise commitments of all the parties to the negotiations. So whilst this democratically elected constitutional assembly was going to negotiate and, and, and draft a final constitution, they had to do it in a way that the 34 principles were captured or appeared in the final constitution. And those 34 principles represent an important compromise in the coming into being of, of South Africa. Now, the fact that, let's do that. The fact that 
the two enemies or the two, two sides, black and white, managed to reach a point of compromise to the point of establishing a constitution in which everybody could see themselves has been widely framed as a miracle. So I call this miracle constitutionalism. And this idea of this miracle is probably one of the biggest reasons why the South African constitution is so widely studied or became so widely well known across, across the world. So if you don't quite believe when I say that it was called a miracle, you don't have to believe me, um, but you can see from all these various references that I have put up there, that this is a book where it's called, where it's, you know, Beyond the Miracle, another one called Beyond the Miracle, another one called The Small Miracle, another one called The Anatomy of a Miracle. And then um, I'll share these slides uh, with Professor Murillo later. There is a documentary called Miracle Rising. So what you what you get in the end is this idea that what happened in South what happened in South Africa the, the compromise that led to to the end of apartheid and establishing what was called the new South Africa is nothing short of a miracle, and and then this miracle narrative then also had certain implications. So i think you should be able to tell that from 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 the way that i am speaking and and the way that i am uh, putting across this idea of miracle that i am critical of this idea of of a miracle and what i have on the screen are just some of the thoughts or some of the ideas of why i'm critical of this idea of 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 um the constitution as as a miracle one of the first reasons is that this discourse of miracle puts across this idea that by arriving at a constitution by arriving at a negotiated constitution and civil war not breaking out in south africa south africa then as a, as a nation was triumphant there was a sense of triumphalism like everybody won like everybody had won like like how we celebrate when we've won when when we've won the world cup uh, for those of you for for those of you who live in countries where you have won the world cup some of us have yet to experience this but but there was a sense of triumphalism that resembled winning winning a, winning a world cup and obviously in the moment of 1994 and 1996 this makes sense but why it's a problem is because it resulted in a situation where people celebrated too people celebrated too long and too hard and forgot that there were actual problems on the ground that needed to be solved. That 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 the fact that a, the constitution had come into place did not magically um, change South Africa from a racist, unequal country into a country where there was simply no racism, there was equal opportunity for everybody, and materially, everybody could, could prosper. So this idea then of, of a miracle does a little bit of, does a little bit of, 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 covering, of covering up. And, and what it results in is this idea that the constitution must, all, must be worshipped, that this constitution is this thing that, that you know, is, can, can never be can never be, be criticized. Um, I'm not going to speak to, to, every, to, all the, to, to all the bullet to all the bullet points there, but but I hope you then get this idea that this idea of miracles seems to suggest that South Africa is exceptional. It's different. South Africa is different from any of the other African countries, and the fact that South Africa has a constitution makes it puts across this idea that you know South Africa's path. South Africa's path is going to be is going to be very different, so we don't have to worry about the same things that other uh, post-colonial states had to to think about. But the interesting thing is this discourse of miracle 
after a while starts to fade away into the background or disappear into the distance and it's replaced by a discourse of transformation such that these days when you hear people talking about the miracle of South Africa they are speaking very much in historical terms and when they speak of transformation, the, 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 the commitments to transformation are more current and they are, you know, forward, they are forward looking. Because I don't think anybody at this point in time can seriously speak about South Africa being where it is as being anything resembling a miracle. But it is quite possible to continue to talk about a country that is transforming. And if one talks about a country that is transforming 27 years after the end of apartheid, it begs the question of why there was this need to shift from the idea of miracle and what are the implications of this shift um, from, from miracle to transformation? Why can we no longer continue to talk about, about a miracle and, 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 and why have we shifted to transformation and that's, this takes us um again closer to you know the, the the core of what we are discussing today which is transformation now before i proceed further and talk about um transformation what it means and the case for transformation and the pitfalls of transformation i want us to take a moment to to think to think about transformation. Those of you that are on the call and those of you that will be watching the video, you all know the word transformation. There's not a single one of us that does not know the word transformation. But what does transformation mean to you? If somebody was to talk about transforming Brazil, the little that I know about Brazil right now is that Brazil is going, has been going through a, troubles, a troublesome moment, you know, depending on where you sit, I guess. I'm sure there are people that call for transformation, but when you think about transformation, how do you understand transformation? What informs your particular idea of transformation? Is your idea of transformation one that is you think is shared by most people or is it one that um you think is shared by only a few people is it one that is concerned with the transformation of institutions or is it one that is you know informed by ideological transformation so what i'm wanting us to do is to actually really do some thinking work about excuse me, how, we under, how, how, how you understand transformation, what has informed how you understand transformation, and what you imagine transformation to be. And having thought about that, an another key question is that of whose role or function is it to set the agenda of transformation in a constitutional democracy? Who do you think should be doing it? Should it be the people? Should it be the people's representatives in the form of parliament? Should it be the executive? Should it be the courts? Or should it be people who live with their rights being infringed all the time? Or do you think that it should be academics and intellectuals who determine what the agenda for transformation is? And then the final question, as we ponder what transformation is, is when you think about transformation, what exactly do you imagine needs to be transformed? Is it the hearts and is it the hearts and minds of people? Is it society? Is it politics? Is it material things? Um, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me for a second. I had, uh, Professor Murillo, can you still hear me? Sorry? Uh, okay, I was going to say, can you still hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. 
we've just we've been having a uh, load shedding where the electricity comes and goes so I uh, saw it going dark so I was afraid that that I had lost you which means that uh, the generator has just kicked in okay so I was afraid that it had, right. I had lost you okay so 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 this is the thing so when we so when we think about when we think about transformation I think it's important for us to also take some time to be reflective about our own thoughts about on transformation and so why is this a key why why are these questions important these questions are very important in the south african context because what you find is that the language or the discourse of transformation has become a central language or a central grammar that informs almost everything academic institutions must transform government must transform the courts must transform schools must transform and so forth and so forth and so forth so this becomes an important this becomes an important question as to what exactly does transformation mean and equally if you are somebody who claims to be committed to transformation what exactly do you claim to be committed to and this for me becomes one of the key problems with the discourse or the grammar of transformation. Namely, the idea that we can never, we are never sure as to what transformation means. And I think this is well captured um, in this quotation by Ronaldo Munch, when he says as follows, and I'll, and I'll read, I'll read a bit of it. On the question of what transformation is, he says, the very nature and meaning of the term transformation itself is unclear. My feeling is that the idea of transformation emerged as a response to the inadequacy of the binary opposition reform revolution in the post 1990s conjuncture. It is at once a goal and a process which is ongoing. It does of course mean many different things to different people some usages being more innocent than others. At the moment, it is attempting to abandon the term altogether, given its current use, misuse, and its almost complete devaluation and stripping of meaning. It seems almost complete, pardon me, it seems sometimes that transformation and democracy refer simply to the outcome that the user desires. And that really, in a nutshell, I think captures the challenge of framing the constitutional vision of an entire country around an idea like transformation. Because this idea of transformation as is captured in that, in that um, phrasing is subject to many different meanings. It depends on who's using the word. It depends on where they are using the word. It depends on when, on when they are using the word. It can refer to social relations, spatial relations, and so forth, and, and so forth. But that doesn't mean that there is no cause to desire transformation in an unequal society like South Africa. So to be fair then, whilst I critique transformative constitutionalism, it's also important for us to see what the case for transformation is. Now, I'm not going to read the quote. I'm not going to read the quote because what the quote really does is that it just tells us that inequality in South Africa is deep is deep and even 27 years after the end of, of, of official apartheid, inequality in South Africa is, is growing. South Africa has been dubbed as this picture on the right says as the most unequal country, as the world's most unequal country. Now, let me explain this picture a little bit to you just to capture um, the levels of inequality. On this side is one of South Africa's most affluent neighborhoods, one of the richest, 
one of the richest parts of Johannesburg. This, this picture is taken, is an aerial picture taken in Johannesburg. So this suburb over here is a suburb called, um, called Santa, where many, many rich people with expensive houses uh, with, and swimming pools and so forth live. Yet over here in the middle, that wasn't, yeah, in the middle is a highway is a highway and what this highway does it is it divides santon from alexandra alexandra is one of the poorest most highly populated places in johannesburg so if one wants to you know ask themselves whether there is really a need for transformation in south africa i think this picture captures it that this is not sustainable it's simply not it's simply not sustainable and what it does is it continues to reflect the inequalities of the past because this neighborhood on the left is predominantly white the neighborhood um the, on the on the right or the settlement on the right is nearly exclusively black so a further um illustration of this need for the case for transformation can be seen in this slide. Unfortunately, um, because I can't have it in full screen, you will you, you will not be able to you won't really be able to see very well what I'm saying. But what it does is it's from the Stats SA, the, st the Statistics Agency of South Africa. It's an official government institution that produces that does the census and and keeps a tab on 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 social economic uh trends in south africa and what it then shows you is the earnings difference in south africa and this is from 2015 it was published in 2016 but it's from 2015. what it shows there is that the average monthly income of a black south african is 6,899 Rand. Compare that to the average monthly income of a white South African, which is 24,646 Rand, which is almost three, three, and, you know, three and a half times that of, of, of Blacks. Then down here, are unemployment numbers, and you can see, Average unemployment rate in 2017 is 31%. That's the official statistic. Um, unofficial statistics place it much higher, closer to 50, possibly over 60% currently. And then you look over here at the average unemployment rate of white South Africans. It's less than, it's less than 10%. So without going into the details, um, without going into the details of, of, of these slides or these, or these factors, what becomes obvious is that whilst official apartheid came to an end, the racialized inequalities or the need for transformation um, continues in, in, in South Africa. So if there is this need for transformation in South Africa, why do I say that this discourse of transformation in South Africa is a problem? And I'll deal with that in the next slide. This discourse of transformation is a problem for some of the reasons that I think should have become apparent to you earlier when I asked us to think about transformation. This discourse of transformation is problematic because it is a discourse that I say is born of compromise. There are no clear indicators as to what um, will signify a transformed South Africa. And because it's born out of because it's born it's a it's it's a discourse born out of out of compromise what we then what we then see is that the one thing south africans agree on is that there is a need for change but whilst there is an agreement on the fact that there is a need for change there is no agreement on what the nature and the substance of that change is. 
And that's to say that in philosophical, political, economic, or material terms, it's difficult to find, um, to find South Africans agreeing on exactly what must change, how it must change, and the rate at which it must change. And therefore, if you accept that, then you have to recognize the problem that South Africa faces or the problem that we face when we all say we are committed to this idea of to this idea or discourse of transformation because in essence we're not actually agreeing to anything specific we're just agreeing to the fact that this must change so fundamentally then what i identify as the biggest problem then of this grammar or this discourse of transformation is that it then exists as a site of compromise. It exists as a place where we can meet and talk and exchange um, ideas without ever having to commit in, 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 in overt terms or in concrete terms to something more material and, 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 and something, more, something more ideological. And when we talk about transformative constitutionalism, hopefully this problem will become will become apparent. So the, the pitfall then of the discourse of transformation is that all it does really is it commits us to it commits us to to agreeing on the fact that change is required and on agreeing to talking about the fact that change is required and therefore time can just keep going as we have these discussions back and forth about what I think is right, what other people think is right and how the constitution should be interpreted and what it might mean and what it might and what it might not mean and and this really is the key as is the key pitfall and as i say in that last bullet point all south africans are committed to transformation well nearly all and all i'm saying there is that considering that people have different understandings or commitments to what transformation is we then have to ask ourselves what is the point of being committed to of, of being committed to transformation and and always talking about talking about transformation without turning it into concrete um, commitments. So coming to the constitutional space and transformative constitutionalism, this idea or this commitment to transformation has ultimately translated into the development of the theory of transformative constitutionalism. And this theory of transformative constitutionalism is one that was put forward by uh, Professor Clare uh, in 1998. And this definition then of transformative constitutionalism is a definition that when you read it is very full of possibility. It says, by transformative constitutionalism, I mean a long-term project of constitutional enactment, interpretation, and enforcement committed to transformation of a country's political and social institutions and power relationships in a democratic, participatory, and egalitarian direction. Continues and says, transformative constitutionalism connotes an enterprise of inducing large-scale social change through nonviolent political processes grounded in law. And basically, he continues to say, transformative constitutionalism reflects neither reform, but it also is not about, it's not about revolution. So, so then this idea then of transformative constitutionalism clearly has some very far-reaching commitments um, or ideas with respect to how it is proposed that we understand or frame South Africa's post-1994 constitutionalism. So in a nutshell, I've reduced the project of transformative constitutionalism to be surmised or to be capable of being summarized in four key points. So proponents of transformative constitutionalism will tell us that as a project, it's committed to transforming 
various relationships in so various power relationships in society so it's got a political leg it's got an economic leg and it's got a social leg which means then they, they, they reject the idea that south africa must continue to be dominated by those that were previously that were empowered under colonial apartheid and that's principally the white section of the population so that's so that's the one commitment then the second claim then is that transformative constitutionalism is political in its nature. And this is an important point to, to bear in mind because what the proponents of transformative constitutionalism tell us is that the very point of South Africa um, adopting the constitutions that it did was to deal with a politics that had become embedded and entrenched in our society. So politics is key or politics is key or should be key to how we understand transformative constitutionalism. I'm going to skip over a bullet point um, number three, which just says it's different from a typical liberal um, constitution. And then land finally on the fourth bullet point, which tells us that according to proponents of transformative constitutionalism, it is a legal enterprise under a supreme constitution and what this should tell us or suggest to us then is that judicial review becomes judicial review or constitutional review in the courts is an important mechanism for enforcing and enforcing and acting and legislating the constitution in accordance with what um carl claire says so what you'll find is that across South African universities, across South African legal disciplines, most of the, most scholars, most learners will speak to transformative constitutionalism as the way that we must understand post-1994 um, constitutionalism. But I've argued in this paper that you've received and in previous work and in other work that this is problematic. This is problematic. Transformative constitutionalism is actually leading us um, astray in certain respects. And I'm going to focus on one critique, one of, the, one of my critiques of transformative constitutionalism. And this critique really is to say that transformative constitutionalism is problematic because it mischaracterizes or reduces constitutionalism to a legal enterprise. And what do I mean by this? What I mean by this is that the way that transformative constitutionalism is framed by Professor Clare and other proponents of transformative constitutionalism is to frame it in a way that we must read the constitution and its provisions in a way that suggests that law is not just the primary way in which we should understand constitutionalism, but almost the sole way in which we should understand the constitutionalist project. Or to put it a bit differently, we must understand it in a way that law or the constitution as a legal document can speak to all facets of how the South African state is constituted. And the way that I put it there is that we are asked to understand constitutionalism in a way that says that if an issue, a problem, a conflict can't be expressed in legal terms or as a justiciable problem, then it falls outside of the realm of the constitutive or the constitutional. And what do I mean by this by way of example is I want us to consider the fullest movements uh, in South Africa, we had the Roads Must Fall movement, we had the Fees Must Fall movement, which were student-led revolts um, against the institutional cultures of universities that remained predominantly Eurocentric, that remained exclusionary, that in many ways operated in racist ways, that in many ways um, excluded uh, students black students or, or, or students from materially poor circumstances because they couldn't pay for, for their education. So these fallist movements had students revolting against academic institutions and against 
um, the state, they called into question the very constitutional foundations of the South African state. One of the key questions that they asked is if this constitution says that we are its primary beneficiaries and is there for us, what is it, what is it doing? What is it doing for us? And the response then of transformative constitutionalists was interesting in that transformative constitutionalist scholars had very little to say about the fallist movements. For the most part, where they engaged um, with respect to the fallist movement in the in newspapers and so forth, it was about telling students that no, the way that they're approaching things is not right, um, there is too much there is too much violence, they expect too much too quickly, and, and so forth, and so forth. There was a failure to respond to the question that the students were putting to us as thinkers, theorists, and scholars. And that question was, what does it mean to have, to have constituted a state that was meant to deliver freedom and liberation, but those that are supposed to be the prime beneficiaries or the future of that state see themselves outside of the way that the state is constituted because they cannot access the goods that the constitutional state uh, purports, purports to give. And, and the reason I suggest transformative constitutionalist scholars were unable to respond to the fallists is because the questions that the fallists were asking couldn't be reduced to a legal question that you could take to court and institute a legal claim over. There were attempts to enforce the right to, to education, but they didn't, get, they didn't get very far. So the problem then with constitutionalism conceived of or conceptualized in, as transformative constitutionalist is that it makes the courts the epicenter of all constitution of all constitution meaning making, which means that when there is a question that relates to the constitution, the expectation is that it must be answered by the courts. And what this then suggests is that constitutional politics, all constitutional politics must be uh, mediated or must be dealt with through the courts. And the one thing that I know uh, that I know um, about Brazil is that when the population is unhappy, people will spill out onto the streets, people will gather, people will protest, people will march, people will demand, and so forth. And the question that we would have to ask in that situation is how would transformative constitutionalists characterize that political action? that is making demands and asking for responses from the legislature and the ex executive. Would transformative constitutionalists want to tell the people to go back into their houses and mount a legal, a legal case? And if we, think of it, if we think of it in those terms, then it is deeply problematic if the only way in which we conceive of constitutionalism is through, is through courts or, of, or, or if we think of constitutionalism only as a legal enterprise. Because if we think of constitutionalism in that way, then what we do is we place ourselves as lawyers, aspiring lawyers, law students, law academics, law researchers, judges, and so forth and so forth, at the center of what constitutionalism means. And if it's just us who are at the center of what constitutionalism means, and it's just us as, 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 as lawyers who can answer constitutionalist quest, constitutional questions, we then have to recognize that the way we understand constitutionalism is very, very elite. It's an elite-driven interpretive, in, in, interpretive enterprise. And the question that I would ask us all to ask ourselves is, how sustainable is that? How democratic? How democratic is that? 
How imaginative is that? What are the possibilities? Is it an empowering or a liberating conception of constitutionalism, or is it a very limiting conception of constitutionalism? I think my bias is, 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 is obvious there, and I don't, I don't have to say much more than that. I'm going to work to wrap up very, 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 very quickly, Professor Morillo. I've got uh, two, more, two, two more slides, which I'll, I'll talk about very quickly. So if I am unhappy with, or I'm critical, it's not about being happy, it's about being critical and, and demanding a different imaginary. If I'm critical of how constitutionalism is understood or imagined, what other way, is there another way of thinking about constitutionalism? And I would say that there is another way that is uh, of thinking about constitutionalism, which is actually more more accurate and more reflective of the dynamics of what goes into constituting a society. Because that's what constitutionalism is about, or what constituting is about. It's about bringing people together and those people standing together as a nation. And it is about constituting a society. It is about constituting a society through particular politics, particular economic aspirations, cultural, um, cultural and social commitments. So this quotation I have from uh, uh, Professor Bakshi tells us some of these key elements of constitutionalism. I'll just read out the highlighted bits. He says to us, but constitutionalism is not all about governance. It's also about contested sites for ideas and practices. Constitutionalism provides narratives of both rule and resistance. And why I like this conceptualization is because it does the different things that we should be thinking about when we think about constitutionalism. It does the power mapping. It talks to that constitutions constitute power and distribute power. And we should be able to track and see how that power um, is, is, is broken up and constituted. It also tells us that constitutions are concerned with social regulation and rulemaking. It also tells us that constitutions respond to a history of a society and, and, and speak to the sociological configuration of a society. So therefore, when we talk about constitutionalism, we can't just think in terms of norms such as human rights, rule of law, separation of powers, the public and private divide. We also have to think specifically about what a, what a particular constitution speaks to in historical terms. What, is, what was the South African constitution purporting to respond to? And, and in purporting to respond to that particular history, then our understanding of constitutionalism must be informed by that. And then, Equally importantly is that constitutionalism must also speak to economic and cultural questions. Economic and cultural context matters because constitutions speak to the economy. The way that a constitution commits to the protection of property or to the redistribution of property is how constitutionalism speaks to, to, uh, speaks to material questions. And and I, I hope you can see how this becomes problematic. If all our, if, if the only way in which we imagine constitutionalism is with the courts at the epicenter of, of, of what constitutionalism looks like. So again, as I said, I'm going to distribute these slides to, to, to Professor Murillo. So I'm not going to say too much there. I'll just jump to the to the you know to the very last bullet point and say that. As far as I'm concerned, and, from, and, and from, from what I've said, I hope it's become quite clear that I don't believe that transformative constitutionalism is an appropriate or an ideal way for us to understand post-1994 South African constitutionalism. And the reason for this is that it is too limited, it is too court-centric, it is too legalistic, and with those sorts of commitments, it can't actually answer the other constitutive questions that are about society, the social, the economic, 
the political and the cultural. And so what I then suggest is that the best way for us to understand transformative constitutionalism going forward is as a theory of adjudication. And it should probably be better understood as some other scholars have suggested as transformative constitutional adjudication rather than a theory of constitutionalism because a theory of constitutionalism it is not. And I, I thank you uh, and I'll be happy to take questions um, from here. Thank you very much, Professor Sanel. Now our students are available to stand up the, your, their hands or uh, write in the chat asking for making questions or even uh, writing Portuguese and uh, Marina uh, will help us translate it into to English. But uh, when they, they think about their questions, I will make a, a small comment. And first of all, I need to say that uh, because of your lecture, I have a big problem. Because I am really curious to read the South African Constitution and to know more about South African constitutionalism. I need to recognize that uh, it, the, the analysis that you present for us in your paper is the thing more interesting that I have seen to comparative studies of Brazilian constitutionalism. And it's really, um, I, I, I need to be really critical because, we've, because of, we, we don't know your, your pieces, your production about uh, constitutional law, even you, your realities have uh, important things to compare with the, the Brazilian constitutional uh, law. And probably you don't know uh, much about Brazilian constitutional law uh, also. Uh, I will repeat some things that I said yesterday, but uh, when you talk about uh, uh, transformative constitutionalism, uh, it's inevitable to remember uh, the idea of neo-constitutionalism that is very, very usual in Brazil. The idea of uh, constituição dirigente from Canutillo, the Portuguese uh, constitutional professor. And uh, uh, what you talked about uh, the compromise uh, uh, solution in the uh, South African constitution. It's, uh, we, we, we live in some uh, similar experience with the Brazilian uh, 1988 constitution because uh, we, uh, by one, one hand, didn't address uh, real the problem of the dictatorship uh, political regime uh, with the amnesty uh, and uh, all the, <clears throat> the, the way that our transition for democracy was done it's really a compromise solution. We, we didn't solve our authoritarian past. And uh, when we think that we have in Brazil uh, a, a constitution that it's a mix of uh, uh, liberal representative constitution and a social democratic constitution when we consider the social and uh, economic rights, we also didn't uh, address the structural inequalities uh, in power and uh, economic uh, matters of our our society and uh, you you use the, the word miracle i you could use also the word faith that we have here in the capacity of the constitutional and the judicial power to change their reality it, and that i agree with you that it's not possible to ch change their reality uh, with uh, 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 Put, putting all our uh, uh, forces and uh, ideas in the power of the constitution and the judicial uh, branch, is considering the, the cultural aspect, the social mobilization, and the, 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 the role of the other branches of the, the state. Uh, um, <clears throat> Also, it's important, uh, of course, you, you know it, it that uh, in Brazil, Brazilian inequality is also a racialized inequality. We have uh, uh, similar in this in this uh, sense at all. So, uh, what uh, I would like to, to highlight 
uh, that it, I, I really would, uh, I think that it would be uh, interesting to continue this conversation because we are talking about the similarities, I am talking about similarities, but to try to understand what's the, what's properly of uh, um, our each, each one countries and what's the difference is academic and political important exercise. Uh, my, my reflections about this subject in, in my current research project is more related not about the, the constitutional itself, but how the, our institutional framework is related to the, the crisis of Brazilian democracy. So my, my only question is about it. Do you also, uh, do you are living in South Africa, just uh, uh, the perception that the transformative constitutionalism as it was built since the 90s was enough, wasn't enough to promote a really transformation in the in, uh, in an equal society, or it, it's a, a factor that would, could explain uh, some kind of crisis of democracy at all, or uh, democracy is not uh, a, a problem, or it's not right to use the theoretical category crisis to describe the political situation of South Africa, uh, because the problem is another, not democracy or liberal democracy itself. Well, many thanks, and I'd like to listen to you a little, and then our, our students. Thanks, 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 uh, thanks, Burilo. Um, yeah, look, it's. I, I guess there's, there's there's many there's a few different there's a few different um, few different facets to it. So I think the first one is is to say that yeah, I think um, I think transformative transformative constitutionalism has has not been has not been enough. And and it can't be, and it can never it can never be enough, because our courts our our, our courts have have very limited have, have lim not very limited they have they have limited possibilities. So you have a situation where you have a good judge you have good judgments here good judgments there they 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 shift the ground in a particular in a particular in a particular matter. But, but then there are certain other things that that they can't that they can't they can't reach. So in, in line, you know, with your with your with your interest of 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 the institutional framework and 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 and, and how it, it connects to, if I understood you correctly, to to the entrenching to the entrenching of um, of democracy. South Africa has in, it has indigenous law. South Africa also has an indigenous law, a layer of a layer of ind indigenous law. Those are social, social and and cultural and actually arguably political institutions, which have their own which have their own life and their own way, and their own way of of functioning. And 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 operating, and I don't think we have actually been very imaginative in how we can draw those institutions into um, into the greater democratic enterprise. And what I'm saying here then is that you, we we occasionally will have cases in the courts that deal with that deal with indigenous law. But almost as soon as those cases are decided somewhere on the ground, people are living their lives in a way that doesn't speak to the court decision. Transformative constitutionalist scholars will analyze this decision, will say that the court has done well, the court has not done well there. But there is a disconnect. There is a disconnect. There's what's happening in the realm of, 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 of legal transformative constitutionalist analysis doesn't connect with, with, with what's happening in society and on the ground. 
Whereas if the work, the work or the theorizing was to look beyond the courts, the scholarship would want to try, the scholarship in my view would have to try and find a way in which it engages with those social cultural institutions on their own terms and sees how they re, how, how how you know how they can have a, a role to play um in a democ in in a democracy because what you end up having is a situation where a lot of the population a lot of the population um exist to give legitimacy to these institutions but they ordinarily do not have a way to participate or to influence how these institutions um how these institutions are are, are put together how they work um and 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 they and so forth so maybe to say a little bit more about my own kind of political commitments my own political commitments are very are very liberatory they are they are, they are influenced by a, a, a you know the idea of a society that's based on 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 mutuality based on 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 connectedness and 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 are committed to you know to structures and institutions where people can see themselves being involved in the society in which they live and at least having the opportunity to see how they can influence those mechanisms and those and those institutions and if the only way that you can do that is through litigation or through the courts you are disempowered and i think that has quite serious implications for how we understand and imagine democracy beyond simply representative democracy and in your country in my country we know what parliament is like it's a it's 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 a it's it's a feeding it's a it's it's a feeding pen it's it's a george orwell's animal farm where the politicians do everything for them do everything for themselves for their benefit they benefit their elite their elite friends and they only know the masses when it's time for elections and they go campaigning and 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 and, and that has to be uh, and, and those are constitutive questions. They are constitutional questions. But if the only institution that really counts in your imagining of, of, of constitutionalism is the court, then those people, for the most part, exist outside of, of your conception of constitutionalism. I hope, I hope that speaks somewhat to, 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 the, to the questions you're raising. Okay, man. Thanks, Professor Nell. We have here in the chat two questions, and unfortunately, Marina, that will would help us with the translation, is uh, not here yet. Uh, he was at the, the class, but uh, have some problems with her internet. So, so I am try. I will try. Uh, Arthur Marchione asked him. He wrote in English, but I read. I think it's better to register to, to the YouTube. Uh, professor, in Brazil, even the transformation through the Supreme Court is being object of question in a society profoundly political apart. Do you think that the great inequality that exists in capitalism allows real democracy or access to human rights? And Guilherme, another question. He, he had written in Portuguese. Let me try. The South African constitution looks to be a uh, aspiration of the exclusion of the political system. This exclusion uh, have been transferred for uh, the establishment of priorities or the impositions of procedures uh, apart from the popular participation engagement in its uh, implementation. Do you understand that the constitution is uh, viable to be applied and enough to a minimal compromise to 
uh, uh, do the democratic debate to promote the, the democratic, democratic debate is the, the two questions that you, you have uh, yet, uh, Professor Sanel. Okay, uh, I'll, let me give them a, a go. Uh, well, so, so I mean to, to, to uh, is it a, a tour's question? Um, yeah, so, so this becomes the thing where the courts, the courts are, are, are involved in, in interpreting the constitution and giving meaning and giving meaning to the constitution, which is, which, which is right for certain questions. I don't have a, I don't have a problem for certain, for certain interpretive, for certain interpretive questions. But when it comes to, 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 to questions of economy, of the economy, which then speak to the political, which then speak to the political economy or the, or, or the distribution, or the distribution of, of, of wealth and the distribution of power in a society, we have to ask ourselves whether courts are the right institutions to do this. And my answer is, is that they are not the right institutions to do this. Whilst, whilst they, they, they don't contribute directly, directly to, to, to causing inequality, I think on another level though, they become part of, 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 of sustaining inequality by virtue of, by virtue of the fact that um, some of the judgments, some of the transformative judgments put across this idea that the courts can answer questions that they actually can't answer. And I think particularly, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to declare that, you know, the right to, to water or the right to, to education in a particular case should be afforded. But the tendency then is that we celebrate that judgment and then we expect things to follow. But if the politics doesn't keep up, if the politics doesn't keep up with those judgments, it leads to, to disillusionment or, or people losing faith, losing faith in the system. And as lawyers, we keep writing about these judgments, but not actually questioning the system. So, so, so the courts then are part of the system, but the courts can't really change, can't really, can't really change, change the system. So, so, um, so it might take one day the court saying that in a capital, in a capitalist system, we can't do much more. And then maybe stepping back and also, you know, throwing down their pens and saying, we can't do more. Um, and, and maybe that, that might be useful. So, so in a direct way, I, I, I don't say the courts perpetuate um, inequality, but, um, but definitely indirectly by putting across the idea that, um, the, you know, that, that the judgments that are made by, by the courts can solve or, or resolve widespread structural, I think, and, and, and Professor Morello raises structural inequality, courts can't, courts can't do that. And that really is one of the problems with, with, with transformative constitutionalism, that it's not modest enough to acknowledge this point. And I think if it was modest enough to acknowledge this point and say that actually it's a theory of adjudication, it would serve us better than what it's doing now. It's, it's, false, it's false promises. Okay, so, so the second uh, Guilherme's question, um, I'm going to, uh, to, 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 to try and, and, and answer it a little bit. If, if I got it correctly, it was to the effect that, you know, considering that uh, through the constitution, uh, there are some people who, who are excluded, do I think that I guess transformative constitutionalism um, it operates in a way that it is it, it's viable for promoting a democratic debate. I don't know if I got that got that correctly. And if I did get it if I did get it correctly, um, it goes again to my to my point that if we don't actually have a constitutionalist discourse that uh, asks 
deep questions about structures, institutions, and the distribution of power. Um, the promotion of constitutional debate can only happen at a surface at a surface level, not a deep level. Um, and 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 so so it, it also depends on what we mean by promoting democratic debate because I think a lot of the a lot of the times even ideas of 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 of, of participatory democracy end at the point where citizens are allowed to say something rather than participating in the decision making and I think and I think that's that's really one of the biggest gaps of 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 of, of liberal democracy that it it um it it it, it yeah, in a way it almost fools us it, it fools us into believing that to be consulted is to be involved in decision making so to be to be allowed to say a few words in the debate actually means that you you are involved in decision making and that's and that's really not that's really not um that's not the reality and i think in in, in most of our lived existences that's not uh, the reality i mean there was a time where everybody was talking about Porto Alegre's participatory budget making. And that seemed like a moment of some excitement of, of some real interest, but even that, even that doesn't get spoken about as much anymore. So I hope I managed to answer those questions. Well, many thanks, Professor Nell. Does anybody have any more questions? Oh, if, if not, I would like it. Uh, uh, more on time to, to say that we uh, was really happy to receive you. Many thanks, Professor uh, Sanelli. And I also would like to encourage, strongly encourage uh, the students that still preparing their, their, their research projects and uh, are interested in comparative studies to considering to develop comparative studies of with South Africa. I think it will be really good for for us and the part from the piece that you shared with us uh, probably they they will be able to find the other references to build their project and if you you agree i'd like to ask your help uh, send us another uh, uh, theoretical reference that you, you think that are important for understanding to, to for understanding of uh, south africa constitutional law Many well, thanks, and I expect that you could come again to Brazil. Uh, I know that you probably will prefer real, but arrange a time to be in Franca also. You'll be very welcome in our university. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In as much as it would be nice to be in person, I'm actually glad that even if it can't happen, we can meet, we can meet like this. And then um, if, if people have projects, uh, I'm, I'm happy to rep to, to if there are certain topics that you want some references on, send me some topics, and then I can, you know, give 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 some give some uh, suggest some readings. I'd be happy to do that. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Thank Wonderful. you. All right. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Right. Bye bye.